so we're pond freed. Can I take your order, please? Welcome to the Gibbons Talks Boxing YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe if you have not done so already. Today I'm very pleased to be joined by the former world champion, Robbie Regan. Um, great to finally interview you, Rob. Um, I've met you a few times over the years at various Welsh Boxing Awards or the Welsh ex Boxer Association get together every September, I see you. Um, I know you're always surrounded by fans, so it's, it's difficult to have a, have a word with you. But um, good to see you. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of full events. Kieran is fine. Now it's great now to finally get around to doing the interview with him. Yeah, because in normal times, everyone's just so busy doing just different things. But I suppose <laughs> one good thing of lockdown, if it is a good thing, we have got a little bit more time for these type of interviews. So, um, yeah, it's good to finally catch up, mate. Definitely, but Definitely. Good to speak to you. Um, so, Rob, how did you first become involved in... Boxing. Well, what it was, um, I went on a family holiday. I think I was, I was nearly fifteen. Um, my uncle Pat who was a professional trainer in a dye gardener camp, and me, and my brother, we dye come on the holiday with us. So we spoke about going to the gym. Um, so we went to the gym when we got back. My brother, I think he, I think he only went twice. You know, it wasn't for him. You know, I, I just as soon as I walked in the gym, I just fell in love with the game straight away. You know, I. I've never been into any sport, but um, as soon as I walked in that boxing room, I fell in love with it. Did you find that you were you were naturally good at boxing from an early age? Yeah, you know, as as soon as I as soon as I hit the bag, really, um, it just felt so natural. You know, I I've never good at any other sport, never into sport, but boxing was definitely for me. And uh, how many fights do you have as an amateur, Rob? I didn't have that many, you know. Um, it was mainly internationals and multinational competitions. With my, was where I was getting fights, you know, being light flyweight. Did I many light flies in Britain? Or if I boxed anybody on a club show, I'd have, you know, I'd be someone coming down from England, or I'd have to go to England boxing. Do you remember off the top of your head how many flyweights or light flies there were in Wales at the time? Because I, I can't imagine there being many at the time. Maybe five. Five. Mm. <laughs> and of course, you, you went to uh, the Commonwealth Games, I believe, in, when was it, um, 86, 87, around that time? Yeah, um, that was the first time I actually ever boxed the Wales. You know, I wasn't even picked. Um, I was sort of like first reserve, so I wasn't picked. I was on a, I, I went and had a break on Perth Call, and after a couple of days, um, I think there's a South African country started pulling out. So I left room for some more boxers, and uh, Two guys from the ABs come down and got me, and they left my. You know, they was they, my name was all over the radio, and they couldn't find me. <laughs> they tracked me down, down in Perth Call. I mean, I, I've been drinking for a week, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> down the dirty duck, is it, Rob? Yeah, that's what remember I the dirty duck. <laughs> so they, what do you remember from the Commonwealth Games? What's your uh, what's your memories? Um, obviously, you know, it's a it's a massive occasion, you know, and, and I was only seventeen, you know, um. To be going to the games at that age, you know, is is, a, is an huge thing. And so I thought, because I, I, I'd be, like I said, I, I, I took a break and I'd been enjoying myself down in Perth Cole. I thought if I get an easy draw and I want to start getting, getting myself in proper shape, I'd have a chance of a medal. But um, I draw, I draw the goal, the favourite for the gold medal in my first fight, Mark Epton. He time maybe a senior champion, a lot older than me, far more experienced. But you know, it didn't, it didn't do me no harm. You know, I know I learned, I learned a lot from fighting guys like him. You know, I, I probably, I had, not, I probably had, not had fifteen fights then. And you're boxing a guy who had probably seventy or eighty odd fights at, at international level and a very high level. So, how seriously did you take amateur boxing at the time? Oh, very serious. You know, um, it's, it's you know, you got to do, you got to do your apprenticeship like turn pro. But my goal was always turn pro because I was in a pro gym and I was pro styled. So after the Commonwealth Games, you you decided to go pro in was it uh, eighty nine? I think it was yeah, eighty nine turn professional. And uh, you were already training with Di Gardner at the time, is that correct? Yeah, right through my amateur career, my professional career, I was Di. So it was just a natural progression for you to, to go pro with die in the corner? Yeah, absolutely. 
So what what made Dai uh, a good trainer for a, a pro fighter like yourself? Well, you know, um, we all know the, the tragedy that happened to Johnny. And, um, you know, Dai took a big break from the game. And he came back, he was training, you know, a couple of decent pros. But um, and when he seen me and I started going to the gym, you know, he took a big interest in me. So I think he knew what I was was so natural and I could, um, you know, go to the top, basically. And how did you find the transition from the amateurs to the pros? Well, quite easy, really, because um, I've been sparring with pros all my amateur career. You know, I was always doing a lot of rounds in the gym with them. You know, um, obviously the pace is a lot slower, but you're doing a lot more rounds. So the progression was just natural, just natural to me. And did you have a, a promoter at the time, or were you just on a casual sort of freelance basis? Oh, um, Guy Garner was um, a part of a promotion team. Um, what, were they, what are they called? Oh, Dragon Boxing. Okay, now Kevin Hayde as well, was it? Kevin Hayde was involved with that. And then Barry Young got involved. So from about my third fight, I had, I had Barry Young behind me, as well as Dragon Promotions. And were you on a ticket deal with them, or how did it work? I know boxers these days they got to sell so many tickets. Was that the arrangement you had, or were you on a, like a weekly salary, or how, how did it work? No, my my persons always agreed, and that's what I get nothing to do with tickets because um, obviously after winning the Welsh and British title, I never had to worry about selling you know, them selling tickets. It was always sold out. Yeah, that's one thing I remember from watching your fights on television and then later going in person to watch them. There's always, uh, you always had massive support. You always took massive crowds. Unbelievable support, you know. And even when I went boxing up in London, my box on the Bamboo, um, I took it from nominal support. I mean, I was chief supporter. I was to Nigel Ben. Um, he was defending his world title. And we was in the same dressing room and I was on after Nigel. And so all you could do was the fans screaming, Regan, Regan. Nigel, <laughs> Found to me because he was going out and he, you know, he made a joke of me. He said, I'm not going out yet. He said, <laughs> it was the same thing. So, did you always have a large support right from the very start of your career? From, from when, when the British title, um, my very first fight, I, I probably didn't have 10 people there in my first pro fight. But, you know, after winning the Welsh title and from the British title, I had phenomenal support. And your first pro fight was a, a draw? Yeah, a draw with um, a guy, Eric George, you know, um, I felt like, you know, I well won the fight, I felt myself, he, he was happy with the draw, but I, I wasn't happy, and unfortunately I had some terrible news the other week, that uh, Eric had uh, have actually passed away, so, you know, I sent my sin- sincere condolences, you know, to all his family, and it's, it's very sad news. So, at the start of your career, a draw... It is a little bit of a setback, I guess. So, did you have any doubts in your mind then, or, or did you just brush that setback off? No, I knew I, no, I knew I won the fight. They even asked the referee about the decision, and his answer to me was, "Oh, you can always box him again." <laughs> right. And do you remember who the ref was that time? Yes, um, it was, it was Ava Bassett. Raver, right? Yeah, Ava. Yeah. Okay. And you fought, fought uh, Kevin Jenkins for the Welsh title. In yeah. uh, 91, your first pro title. Yeah, that was, you know, it was a good fight. Good fight for the crowd. Um, you know, I won, basically won every round. And um, it, won, it won Sky Sports and, and the card fight of the year. So when you think of all the title fights you are, you know, but there are thousands of undercard fights. For, for, so for that fight to win the undercard fight of the year was, um, you know, a nice achievement. And from early on in your career, as you mentioned there, you, you were fighting on television. So... I'm guessing fairly over a real short period of time in your life, you went from fairly unknown to being a, a face people recognise around the place. Yeah, you know, I, I fought for the British title. It was all, for the British title, it was only my same fight. You know, I boxed um, Joe Kelly. He, he was a big, he was a big favourite. He's a lot more experienced than me, you know. But um, I showed him when he came down. I showed him what I could do, you know, and I put on a, a display which was second and then, you know, to win the British title. But, but was it difficult for you to go from just a normal guy, a normal amateur boxer, to being um, on television, to being well-known? I'm guessing people would probably, wouldn't 
back in those days, they'd ask for an autograph. And yeah. to, uh, just speaking to you. And, you know, it, it happened so quick, you know. It is, it is a bit of a shock to the system, but, uh, you know, it's a nice shock. Because hmm. I suppose when you, when you first started turning pro, it was just your friends who used to come along and then other people who would join in. And then as you started winning titles, more people would jump on the bandwagon. And then I suppose you, you got fans. Because I, I, I consider myself a fan of yours when, when you were boxing. And I, myself, my father and my brother came along to your fights. And of course, you, you didn't know us. You don't know who we were, but we were there cheer, cheering you on. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, like I said, in my first fight, I don't, I don't think I had 10, 10 people there, to be honest with you. Yeah, and, and what, what was it about you that made you so popular amongst the fans, do you think? Um, uh, just, be, just being who I am, you know. I'm just... I'm, just, I'm, I'm the same as everybody else, you know. I'm just a local boy, you know. I'm... So I didn't do my best. And um, you fought Francis and Pofo, which I, I believe you lost on cuts. Yeah, you know, I, I beat him before that, and that was, that was my first defence and British title. You know, it was 11th round, you know, there was only one round left. And um, Francis butted me about four or five times, you know. I, I you know we should have been disqualified as far as I'm concerned. Um, but Mickey Van, the referee, um, it was obviously to me it was corn he was in because he put it in his uh, in his autobiography after the fight. He remembered referee in our fight and he said and he said in his book that he's glad Francis won because he's a nice boy. But I'm a nice boy as well. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, I mean that sounds very oh. uh very curious. Yeah. yeah, well I I've read Mickey Van's book and I mean I, it was a good while ago now, but um yeah, I mean it's not the type of thing you'd expect from a, a world class referee. Absolutely. But Francis was a lot, a, quite a short guy, even for a, a flyweight. And his style and your style is, is going to lead to a uh, clash of heads and that type of yeah. thing. It, you know, it was all intentional, really, just, rec- just reckless, really. And so do you think Francis and Pofa was a dirty <laughs> fighter or was it just one of those things due to the styles? Well, you know, I think you've got to make your own opinion up on that because, um, you know, I've never stopped a boy on a cut in my life, and I think Francis stopped maybe four, five, six as a professional. And I remember the rematch with Francis and Pofo. That was in the ice rink in Cardiff. Um, I remember that, that was actually the first fight I went to with my father. My father and my brother went along to watch the fight. We were sitting in the cheap seats, quite a distance away, but it was still a good... I think everywhere had a good, had a good view in the, in the old ice rink. But I, what I remember was... I'd actually brought some binoculars with me, some a small right. pair of binoculars. And because they, all the fans were concerned about you getting cut, I was looking in, in, in between the rounds or during the rounds, checking that you weren't cut. Yeah. And people are all asking me do, as the fight was going on, oh, what's Robbie? Has he been cut? Has he been cut? That type of thing. I think that's why they, they took the fight, actually, and come back down here, because it was only like three months after the fight. I think that's why he was hoping that the cut would open back up for three months out. Was a friend of mine who who, who done all this, you know, who done fix my eye, you know, he done such a good job on it, and he put in extra stitches, and done such a fabulous job on it. I never had problems with it again. In my boxing career, so I, I thank him for that. Yeah, Ray, if I'm right in saying he's, he's a, a doctor, an Irish doctor with the the border control. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So doctor. So, were you concerned with, with the cuts after the, the fights with um, Francis and Pofo that, that they were going to be an issue going, ahead and, going forward in your career? No, I never cut as an amateur, you know, and um, never cut as a professional only that one time. So, you know, I, ne- I never worried about it after that, no. And once you won the British title, obviously it's an iconic belt. Uh, it's, it's the belt that probably all British fighters want to win prior to moving on to, to bigger honours. I mean, what did it feel like for you that, you know, when you were British champion? And I'm right in saying as well, you you um you, you won the, the Lonsdale belt outright after that? Yeah, you know, I was, that was my priority, was to win the Lonsdale belt outright before I moved on to anything else. Um, and I done that, beating James Drummond, who was a very good fighter, who just, the fight before, he was robbed for the European title. So, you know, he come to win, you know, and... And uh, that you know, he, he gave his all. You know, I never seen a boy cry so much after a fight after he beat him. And you know, you know, I felt sorry for him in a way. But but you know, 
to win Lonsie Bell outright with my, with my dream come true. And at what point did you start to look towards world honours? Because you know, winning the, the British title is the, the first major milestone for a British fighter. Uh, was it this stage that you thought you might be something special? Well, yeah, I, I thought, you know, um, my, my British title performances, I think even then I showed I was world class. Um, obviously, the next step up was European level. So I wanted to win all, all the belts, and that's the way I wanted to do it. And then to win the European title against Salvatore Fani. Um, we never boxed out, you know, we never defended outside the country before. It took a lot of money to get him to Wales. You know, he had a lot of knockouts on his record. And it was, it was a great fight, you know. I well well won the fight unanimous decision, but I, you know, he was a great sportsman after losing. He picked my daughter up and gave her a kiss, you know, and I, and I thought, you know, what a man after that. Big respect for him. And did you notice the, the standards increasing? Did you find the fights more difficult as you went up the levels? Oh, definitely, you know. Um, it's, a big, it's a big jump from British, from domestic to European level, you know. That's a, that's a big jump up, you know. There's a lot, a lot more fight clubs. And Europe is, a, you know, a very big place. Well, three quarters of the world just about, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I guess at, at this stage of your career, you'd, you'd won the British, you'd won the European. Um, your team, I guess, at this stage, was setting their sights on world honours. Absolutely, yeah. You know, um, we were looking, looking who would be the first available champion that we could perhaps challenge. Did your team have a have a plan in place to to get that world title fight, or were we were just trying to stay busy, trying to stay fit? The plan was to you no know, defend my European title, maybe once, twice. Pat Clinton was a WBO champion at the time, which. Which um, he was with Tommy Gilmore, which is which was part promotion with some with some of the fights with uh with Matchroom. So that fight would have been easy to make. So that was my aim was to fight Pat Clinton, but unfortunately he lost the belt of Baby Jake and Matlala. And uh, you didn't fight Baby Jake, if I'm right in saying, no? I signed I signed to fight Baby Jake, and I I give up the European title, and I find. Signed to fight Baby Jake in Wales, and all of a sudden, then he, he, I defended my title against Danny Porter. And I blew him away in three rounds, and Baby Jake decided that he wasn't coming here. <laughs> so, what, what stage was that fight at? Was it actually signed? Was it yeah, signed the contract? Fight, fight them in Wales, give up my European title, um, you know, and. And unfortunately, that contract went missing when Baby Jake wouldn't come. No one could find the contract. You know, it was worth a lot of money. And I would have stood up in any court. So that was an hard pill to swallow. And I give up, and I, you know, and I give up my European title. I didn't even have a title to defend. So whose advice were you taking to give up the title? Or was it that just a decision you made yourself? No, you know, Di advised me to take, give up the European title and sign the fight with Lala. Yeah. My family begged me not to give up the European title. My, my dad, he didn't want me to give it up. But my dream was always to fight for the world title. So when I jangle that card in front of you, you don't, you, you don't need much else, you know, to do what you'd ask. Uh, in uh, 1995, you got your shot at the WBO world title. Uh, what's your recollections of that? Against Albert Jimenez, he's a fantastic champion, you know, a very big hitter. Um, I mean, I knew I was going to be a tough fight in any case, but uh, I had problems with my hand before our fight. Uh, um, I damn badly damaged my hand. Where I had to have two operations, and I had to pull out of the fight. Um, and for him and to wait, I had to. He wanted more money, so they took. They asked me, you know, we will we get him and to wait, but I will have to come out to you first. So I said, you know, I don't care if he wait. Take it out of my purse as long as he'll wait until I'm ready to fight. And then the fight was made, and coming up to the fight, he pulled out, Imanez pulled out. So I said, well, if I got to wait for him, I, I'm not going to give him that money. I want what's originally agreed. And they said, yeah, that's all right. That's all, that's all done now, signed, signed and sealed. And come the day of the fight, I found out that they still took our money out of my purse. And that's, not, um, that's something you, you don't need going into a world title fight. The first time I've ever, ever in my life, I just didn't want, didn't want to be in the ring. So you, you say they took the money out of your purse. Who took the money out of their purse? 
Uh, Frank Warren. Frank Warren was paying me. So, but, but did you have a contract for that? I mean, presumably it was yeah, in the contract, the contract that... They had a contract for it. But they agreed to give him the money to wait. Yeah. But then when he when he pulled out, I said, yeah, but I, I'll wait for him, but I want what originally agreed. And I was told that that's, that's all been done now. And come day of the fight, I found out that it, it wasn't right. You know, and um, when Frank Warren's words for me, well, call the fight off. You know, and that's not what you need, your know, preparation, you know, going into a world title fight, especially with, um, you know, the energy I was carrying in any case. You know, my head was all over the place. You know, he didn't box Robbie Regan and I, he fought his shadow. Yeah, and the fight itself was a, was a tough fight for you. I think you were behind on the cards and was, uh, you, you were pulled out by a corner in the ninth round. Yeah, I was definitely behind, you know. Um, first five rounds, it hit me everywhere. But um, I had a brilliant seventh, eighth and ninth round. And at the end of the ninth round, his power had gone and he'd winked at me. You know, and um, and I knew that he would have struggled more than I would have to get through him last few rounds, the championship rounds. And I think I, I, still, I still had a very good chance of beating him with everything that's gone on. So why, why did you corner pull you out of the fight with all that said? I don't really know, to be honest with you. I mean, you don't know, watch the fight back yourself and, you know, you, you have a look at the last few rounds and you decide if you, if you would have pulled me out. I'd like to see your, your opinion on it. Yeah, I, I will do, actually. I, I will watch our fight back. I mean, the comment accommodators we were shocked shocked that they've been pulled out so what did your corner tell you uh, did, did they tell you in between rounds eight and nine that if you didn't produce no. a good round that they'd pull you out or was it just no, screw at the moment you know just I come back up the next round they just told me the fight was over and I just broke down crying because I didn't know why and McGuigan said I was crying in the corner I was crying because the fight had been stopped that's why I was crying <laughs> Did you ask your corner men, ask your team why the fight was stopped? I didn't, to be honest with you. I, I know I, I've always put my faith in them and in the die and, you know, and I always trust them to make the right decision. But, you know, um, obviously on the night he must have thought he was making the right decision for me, but I know in my heart and I watched the fight back that they should, shouldn't have been pulled out. And have you and I discussed that fight at all since the no, event? Yeah, we spoke about it after, you know, that's, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's done, that's dead, you've just got to move on now and, and just see what comes up. And my next two performances were my best performances, so a, a, a good thing come out of a bad thing. So your next fight was for the interim IBF title, I believe, am I right in saying? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, and, um, but t- despite not being happy with uh, Die Gardner stopping your, your fight previously, you, you still stuck with Die and you still your trainer? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think he, he felt he made the right decision for my best interest, even though I disagree with the decision. You know, I still think he thought he'd done the right thing. So, so I, st- I still had, had my faith in Die, and he was, you know. You've always been a brilliant trainer, so you know, yeah, I fit for him. Because that, that's something very old school, by by you no know, by today's standards. Certainly, boxers these days, as soon as they have one or two losses, they quite often go off and find another trainer. Whereas you yeah. stuck to stuck to stuck with die. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you can't you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I I believe I know, and like I say, die always got me in brilliant shape. But, and and got me to where where I was and um like I say my my next two performances was probably the best performances of my career. So your next fight that was against the uh, Tunisian for the IBF interim title. Tell us about that fight. Yeah, it was for the IBF interim title because um Danny Romero was injured, so they had an interim champion. Um, there was a dispute on a day that they wasn't going to be for the interim title, but. Ben Jed, who was the number one contender, and he said, unless it's for the interim title, I'm not fighting. So it was for the interim title, and um, I paid my my sanctioning fees. It was the, uh, the IBF judges, the number one contender, and I, I knocked him out in the second round. 
and uh, and then after the fight, when Danny Romero was well enough you know, to fight again, he, his first defense had to be against me, but he, he didn't want to fight me. Danny Romero turned the fight down, but they wanted me to fight then another number one contender where I should have been made full champion and had the biggest percentage of the purse. Yeah. So, in any case, so I, I was thinking about, who, who, well, discussing who I was going to be fighting, blah, blah. And then Frank Warren come along with an offer for me to fight for the Bantamweight title. Just um, before, I, sorry, Rob, just, just before we go on to the, the Bantamweight title fight, um, your fight with Ben uh, Jeddu, the, the, the knockout itself is probably one of your most dramatic knockouts of your career. Uh, talk us through the knockout. Yeah, well, he was unbeaten, I think, in about 19 fights. He had, like, 17 knockouts. Um, I know as soon as I hit him, you know, I saw, I saw, I saw millions and millions of left hooks, but, you know, yeah, that was one in a million and just threw it absolutely perfect. And he was out by the time he hit the floor. And I actually really thought he was seriously hurt. I was just happy after the fight that he, he got up and recovered. He had to have a night in the hospital, but he was, at least he was safe and well. Was it one of those type of punches where you just knew as soon as it landed, you, you just knew that the fight was over? Absolutely. You know, he fell face forward and, you know, you, them sort of punches, you feel right up your arm and he fell first forward and, you know, the referee didn't even, didn't even have to count. He just waved off as soon as he hit the canvas. And what did it feel like for you when they announced you as the new IBF interim world champion? First of all, I want to make sure that he, he was all right and then... When they announced me as champion, you know, that was absolutely tremendous. It was a dream come true. Yeah, I bet. And uh, how, how did you celebrate winning that title? Um, as I always celebrate, well, you know, day to day, the fight, I always go home. I don't go anywhere after the fight. We cover, you know, and then the next day, we uh, we go for a drink with my friends and my family. And did winning that title, did it change your life in because obviously, that, again, that, that fight was on television. It was yeah. a really, really dramatic knockout. Uh, it was replayed countless times on the news. Did, did, that, did that change your life overnight? Yeah, basically, you know, people look into win as, as the world champion. And um, it's, you look, everyone treats it in a slightly different way. It's, it's, quite, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely feeling, you know, to achieve your dream and repay all your... The, the, Fans and the sport, we pay the, the belief. Uh, Romero was the the full champion. Yeah, and uh, that would have been a really big fight for you if if it had come off. You could have made some really serious money. Yeah, that would have been a massive fight, massive money. Um, but Danny Romero decided he didn't want to fight me and go up in weight. Um, then they wanted me to fight number one, another, another, another contender would actually be made full champion at the biggest percentage of the purse. And at that time, Frank Warren came along with a, an offer to fight for the Bantamweight title, which I've been struggling for the last two years to uh, to make flyweight. And I just waited for the right opportunity to go up to Bantamweight. And then to have a shot at the title in my first fight, I, I jumped at the chance. I jumped at the chance. So you fought that Daniel uh, Jimenez for the WBO bantamweight title. Uh, you won a unanimous points decision. Was in yeah. the was in the ice rink again? I can't, I, I wasn't at that fight. Get again, sorry, mate. The Fire Garden. Oh, the Fire Gardens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, talk talk us through that night, Rob. Yeah, you know he, he was a massive favorite. I fought one. I was a fought one underdog and eighty to one to win in any round. You know, he 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 travel. He come over here three times before, seen beaten three quality fighters. He beaten um took a super bandweight title off our uh, three weight world champion Duke McKenzie. Um, he beat a good fighter in the British champion Duke Rockerty, and he took the bandweight title actually off Alfred Corby, who was a, was an exceptional talent and very highly regarded. And Imnez beat him. Um, unfortunately, Alfred Alfred passed away last year, so uh. May he rest in peace. He was, he was a great fighter. I remember doing an exhibition with him, so I knew how good Alfred was. And for him and S to beat them was it was um quite an achievement. So I knew I I knew I had a I had a very good um a very good champion to fight. And and again, you you were announced world champion in, in your next fight. What was that like to be announced the WBO well, bantamweight champion of the world? 
there was a couple of things there, you know. Um, I put him and down in the eighth round, and I was a 14 second count. And he actually lost the Super Bandway title on points to Mark, the great Mark Antonio Barrera. And Barrera couldn't didn't put him on the floor. And for me to do that was there no big feather in my cap. And then when when I was crowned WBO Bantamweight champion, that made, you know, I became Wales' first two weight world champion. And I'm and the first ever uh, champion at Bantamweight. And still to this day, I'm still the only Bantamweight champion Wales have had in about 140 years or whatever it is. So you're the Bantamweight champion of the world, uh, WBO. Um, what was your team's plans for you going forward? Yeah, I had um, a couple of defences, you know, different opponents. Um, we picked Drew Doherty to uh, make my first defence against. So Drew's a good fighter, a good friend of mine. So we give, wanted to give him the opportunity. And then unfortunately, um, I come down with a bad virus. I had glandular fever, which which was now diagnosed for months and months. You know, I, I thought I was going wrong to bend, to be honest with you, because no one could tell me what was wrong with me. But I knew something was wrong. And then... Um, a specialist who specialises in foreign blood disorders found out that Epstein Barr, which is a which is a serious glandular fever virus, which um Joan Alumo actually got well, so had the same virus and it finished his career. And look at the size of how big a man he is, you know, and it finished him. I'm right in saying I think that the the WBC champion at the time as well was yeah. uh, Wayne McCulloch from yeah. Northern Ireland. I mean, what was there ever a possibility of a, a yeah. fight between yourselves? Yeah, straight after the fight when they won the title, um, Frank Warren offered Wayne the fight, and that's the fight they wanted. But he decided um, he didn't want to fight me and to move up, and he boxed Nassim Mohammed instead. Yeah, because that, that would, be, would have been a massive fight between uh, you know, two Celtic warriors. Yeah, absolutely. If you, uh, if you watch the fight back, when, when they interview him, Frank, when we by ringside, Frank offers him the fight. And you know, we'd fight him with collect, but I, I had to fancy my chances. And and what do you think of Frank Warren as a promoter? Was he was he fair to deal with? Was he easy to deal with? Well, no, like all promoters, you know, they they out for themselves. <laughs> they make no mistake about it. They're not out for you. They out to make money for themselves. Nothing, no, no, no other reason. And but whatever you were dealing with, Frank Warren, <laughs> did you deal with him personally, or did you did Di Gardner speak on your behalf, or who, who was your manager oh. at the time? Obviously, Di was uh, still managing me then. Um, but any deals that was done with Warren, we both go up and sit down with him. So after the after you won the WBO title and you had the the the, the, the glandular fever, um, what what was the next stage for you? I believe that was that was the your final fight, your career. Yeah, that was that was my final fight. You know, um, I tried to come back, and I still had this fight. That's so, I mean, the doctor gave me the Oakley, but I knew I won right. And then uh, the shock then was as I failed a brain scan with that, that he found scar tissue that was actually there a year previous, which they didn't pick up. So, you know, I knew I wasn't right. You know, um, I was still, you know, even done a press conference with Drew Dockery, and I think I was still four, four five pounds overweight two days before the fight. But I couldn't train. I couldn't train like I used to train because of the glands of fever. So I, I think. The fight wouldn't have happened in any case. I think I would have lost on the scales. And what was it like for you uh, mentally and psychologically? Uh, you, you finally won a world title. And for people who don't really follow boxing closely, you only get really make good money or big money once you got a title and you defend it a few times. So you finally had a chance to win some big money, be in some big fights. And then through no fault of your own, you had this opportunity taken off you. Um, how did that feel? How did you deal with it? Uh, it, 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 well, it finished me. It, it broke me. It broke me. You know, um, you don't make you don't make money in the smaller weights unless you are world champion. Any sort of money, so you know, it, it absolutely finished me as you know, mentally, physically, just just broke me down. You know, um, I had a bad few years. My marriage, um, my marriage broke down. You know, I was, I think, I was self medicating with drink. You know. And like drink becomes an addiction, so 
so you know people see you out drinking and smiling and laughing and joking and I'm I'm just drinking to because I want to forget what what actually happened to me. Trying to forget. And did anyone within boxing offer you any support, or did the border control at the time? Did they have no, any I, um, way of helping boxers like yourselves who were retiring from the sport? There was absolutely nothing then, nothing to help you. Um, you're on your own, um, which is it's good to see today. At uh, which who I'm an ambassador for is um, Ringside Rest and Care, Dave Harris and, and the team are doing brilliant things for fighters who've, who've fallen on hard times, who've been injured. They're trying to get uh, um, something built where they can look after fighters who need it, who needs help. They're trying to fight, build a 36 bedroom place to look after fighters, like I say, who, who need it, which is a fantastic thing. Um, I'm actually going, as like I say, I'm an ambassador. And we're actually doing a trip to America now in October. Um, there's me and a few other champions, John Conte, um, Michael Watson, Steve Collins. And we're going over um, to tour in Florida. And they're having a couple of black tie events. Other champions, American champions out there where the fans can meet us and et cetera to raise money for inside rest and care. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So after you've... Uh gave up your world title and um, you went through a, a bit of a, a, a tough few years in hindsight what would you have liked the british boxing board to control to have done to to assist you and not just you uh, other people in your position well you know um well get get people you know you got, you got medical staff who, who, who looks who, who, who looks after fighters when they're injured now you know they should set up some sort of counseling from or any any sort of help they, they they need, you know, they should help fund it. And you know, like I said, ringside wrestling here are doing marvelous things, and I don't think one promoter have done anything to help them yet. Or or, or going to. I mean, these promoters have got very very healthy bank accounts because of these boxers, and some of them, like I said, who needs their help now. So they should be giving back to this to the to the men to the sport they they pretend to love. And it's not just uh, financially you'd miss the sport because at the end of the day that, that was your job, you were a professional boxer, but, but physically as well. I mean, you, you were in the routine of training regularly, boxing regularly, looking forward to fights. All, all that was just taken away from you all of a sudden. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a, your life is full when you're boxing. You know, you're training every day. Um, maybe you're making some appearances somewhere. It's, your time was filled up, you know, and when that's taken away, there's a massive void in your life. And it's very hard to fill because, you know, um, like fighters like myself, you know, you absolutely love the sport, love love everything about the sport. When that's taken away, it's, it's, it's like a death in a family. It's, it's unbelievable. And around that time, did, did you, were you thinking about retiring from boxing or did you still plan to have a few more years left? Oh, I absolutely wanted, I wanted to make about, I think I had, Four fights left in my contract, or three fights left in my contract with Warren. I think it was a million pound. I made a million pound, and that, that's when I decided I, I, that's when I wanted to finish and finish up the top. So, what did you do for for work, and what, what did you do with yourself well, after I, after the, the the title was taken from you? You had to give up the title. Um, I got offered a job by a good friend as as a as a, a, a legislator. Um, electrician apprentice, you know, it was just, it was just something to to keep me occupied. It was, but you know, it, it was it was <laughs> it wasn't something I didn't really want to do. So you know, so when you're doing something that you don't want to do, is from 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 doing something that you love, you know, it's it's, it's impossible. It's impossible. So I wanted to start. I wanted, to, I had the money. I wanted to start up. Um, becoming um. A boxing equipment supplier, you know, but um, someone talked me out of that, and I, I, I just shouldn't have listened to him. I should have done what I wanted to do. Yeah, because did you want to stay involved in the sport then, Robbie? Yeah, yeah, you know, like that way, you know, first of all, some um, supplying equipment and whatever, and then maybe, maybe go back in, into the training side of it or managing side of it. I did start, me and my friend Julian, we did start our own gym, amateur gym. 
but unfortunately, um, the people who had the building sold the building, so that that was that was gone. So, what when you were forced to retire from boxing, did you keep in contact with boxing people? Did you keep keep in contact with Di Gardner and the other people in the gym? No, no, you know, no, not at all. Um, I just, 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 just stuck with the friends I had around me. Really, um, like I said, um. I, I had a job offered from my friend who had an electrical company. And at the time, you know, he put on a testimonial like we did, which was a great event. Um, Brian Wilkwigan come down, John Conte, Colin Jones, you know, they all come down to honour me and it was, a, it was a great night. And I believe you've also, you've also had other uh, big nights honouring the, the things you've achieved in boxing. Am I right in saying you were in uh, Monaco? With, uh, was it Prince Albert fairly recently? I turned to my good friend, Russ Morgan, who's been there for me since I finished boxing. You know, he's a great friend, you know, and I, I love him a lot. I mean, it's unbelievable. I had um, the 20th anniversary of winning the world title in Monte Carlo. And it was one in Cardiff. But, you know, to have that in Monte Carlo, you know, how many fighters get that treatment? And then, obviously, Prince Albert had heard about me or heard about this event. And I got invited to a private party of his. I know you know how many people or Xboxes get invited to the Prince Albert or to the Prince's party. Um, as unbelievable. <laughs> so what was Prince Albert like? He's a he's a really um a down to earth guy to be honest. With you. A lovely a lovely man. Um, you know, is I I don't know if you know, but his mother is actually Grace Kelly, the actress. Right. And now on um it's the twenty fifth anniversary this year. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah, my agent has uh, got a lot of things lined up for me. Um, obviously, with Russ, Russ is putting on a night, a 25th anniversary night for me now in Rome because he's living in Rome now. So he's going to put a night on for me by the Coliseum, which is very, very fitting because, you know, the glass <laughs> and boxes are gladiators. So I'm really looking forward to that. And that's a big thank you to my friend Russ. Um, and it's going to be one obviously local for 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 all my fans who can't travel to Rome once the lockdown is over. And you know we'll have one local for for all my fans, which will that'll be another great night. So when you look back on your career, Robbie, uh, have you any regrets? I mean, apart from the way it ended, obviously. I mean, are there any fights out there you would like to have had? No, I achieved my dream. You know, it's a dream come true, and um. And, and another thing I was I was told that I'm I'm the only Welsh world champion that never hit the canvas. So, so I'm very proud of that. And with, you know, my my chin was one of my biggest accolades as well. And uh, yeah, you you were part of a, an exclusive club of only I think I'm right to say eleven Welsh world champions. Something like that, yeah. You know, yeah. How how much does that mean to you to be part of that exclusive club? It's, it's fabulous, me. You know, um, I'm very, I'm very proud Welshman. Very proud of my fans and the sport I had. So, so um, like I keep saying, to uh, we pay their belief in me and bring two world titles to, to Wales means means the world to me. And you know, even though I didn't make the money that I should have, you know, that gives me a lot of joy on its own. And how are you these days, Robbie? Um, you know, like mentally, physically. I mean, what are you doing with yourself day to day? A far better place now. I know I got these great things happening to me because of the I and because of my friend Russ. Um, I got two young boys, so they take up a lot, more, a lot <laughs> of my, my time. So you know, yeah, like like we like we pretty good at the minute. And are you involved in boxing at all now, whether as a trainer or a coach or an advisor or anything? No, I, I know. Um, if anybody wants my advice, that you know they can. I give them my advice. Um, I still go to more or less the big fights now. You know, I still watch the big fights. Um, I still love the game. You know, um, it's it's changed a lot since since my day. But you know, any, any big fight, I'm you know, I'd I'd, I'd I'd be one sitting down and watching, it, especially if a Welsh boy is fighting. What do you think are the big changes in boxing today compared to back in your day? Um, well, there's obviously more money with the pay per view, and you know, and fighters are sort of getting title fights. 
a little bit easier and they were, they were all having that many fights before they chucked in. You know, and some of them are not, not ready for world title fights. You know, but they've just been chucked in because of the money. And if someone did approach you, a young boxer, thinking of going pro, what advice would you give them? You know, you, you've got to... Let, you know, you've got to live the life, you know, you've got to give it 110%, you know, get yourself a good trainer, get yourself a good manager, you know, have a look around and see what's interesting now. And, and, you know, just don't sign a contract, whatever they want there, make sure you've got, to, got in the contract what you want in there and what you, you want out of the game. And who are the boxers you enjoy watching today, Robbie? A lot, you know, I like all the Welsh boys. You know, we've got some good prospects, and Cody and Cody Davis, Joe Codina. You know, every next see Gavin Gwynn win a uh, Commonwealth title. You know, he's um, he uh, he lost his, his his two British title fights. You know, but you know, he's still there. He's still trying. So, so. One deserves to win the title. He deserves, um, you know, there's obviously the big, the big fights, the big fights and fighters. They um, Tyson Fury and Joshua. I like to see that fight happen. I'm gonna put you on the spot now, and Robbie, as a former world champion yourself, you're probably more qualified than 99% of people to, to answer this. Who do you think is gonna win uh, Fury against uh, uh, Joshua? Um, like I said, you know, every week boxing is so unpredictable, it only takes one punch. Um, but if I had to had to go with someone today, I'd have to go with Tyson Fury, probably late stoppage or on one points. And what about our fellow Welshman Liam Williams, possibly going out to America to challenge for the WBO yeah. middleweight title? That's not you know, it's not gonna be easy going to the guy's backyard to fight with, you know. I, I see a big improvement in Liam, you know, and I and I believe he can do it. He, he's going to have to box, you know, from the performance of his life, which which he probably knows. But he's, he's more than capable of winning, winning our world title. And sometimes, Robbie, when you watch boxers and when, when you talk about boxing and when you're around boxing people, do, do, do you still feel the tingle? Do you still feel the urge to, to want to box again? Is, is that still inside you? Um, yeah, you always got to, you know, you, you always remember, you know, it brings back memories, doesn't it? You know, and and the fighters that I used to look up to, you know, you know the, the, the great um, Maud Winston, Jimmy Wilde, you know, and then to the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, Agla and Duran, the four Kings, you know, we bring back all their memories, and it's, 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 it's still, you know, it's great, great memories to have. Okay, Robbie, um, thanks for your time this afternoon. It's been great to talk to you. I, I've wanted to interview you for a very long time, so it's great to finally pin you down. Uh, if people want to follow your career or follow your progress and follow where you're up to, uh, I want social media. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. That's- um, I'm WhatsApp, but it's just Facebook. As, as you know, that's enough for me. One's enough. <laughs> I think, like, can I just? Yeah, I think you know. I'll always be so grateful for the tremendous support I had. You know, they really truly made my fight nights electric, and everything I achieved in the ring and every title I won, a piece of that belongs to each and every one of my fans. You know, and I and I love them all. Okay, thank you, Robbie. And I think anyone who's been to your fights over the years, including myself, can um, would agree with you that they were absolutely amazing nights and absolutely electric atmosphere. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you coming and supporting me. No, no problem, mate. I'll uh, great to speak to you, and hopefully, I'll see you in person sometime in the near future, mate. Yeah. Hello, sir. We're Pontypridd. Can I take your order, please? 